Hello, and welcome to the State of 911 webinar series hosted by the National 911 Program. My name is Sherry, and I will be the moderator for today's session. This webinar series is designed to provide useful information for the 911 stakeholder community about federal and state participation in the planning, design, and implementation of next generation 911 or NG911 systems. It includes real experiences from leaders utilizing these processes throughout the country. Today's session will feature presenters from the National Governors Association and the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Emergency Communications, along with the State of Oklahoma. Michael Garcia, a policy analyst with the National Governors Association, and Mark Grubb, an IT specialist with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, will provide an update on the regional workshops held to develop action-oriented plans to enhance state governance structures in emergency communication. Mr. Lance Terry, the Oklahoma State 911 Coordinator, and Nikki Cassingham, the Oklahoma Statewide Interoperability Coordinator, will share their experiences attending one of the workshops and creating a 911 plan. For more information on the National 911 Program webinars, or to access our archived recordings or learn more about the National 911 Program, please visit 911.gov. Feedback or questions about the webinars can be sent to the National 911 team at mcp911.com. If you are experiencing technical difficulty with the WebEx application, please call WebEx Technical Assistance at 1-866-229-3239 and select Option 1. Please note that all participants' phone lines have been put in a listen-only mode, and this webinar is being recorded. To ask questions of our presenters, feel free to take one of two actions. Using the WebEx chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen, enter your question at any time during the presentation, and it will be entered into the queue. This feature is not visible while your screen is in the expanded full-page view. Or to ask your question live, use the raise hand feature to request your phone line to be unmuted and you will be called upon to ask your question. With that, I would like to introduce Ms. Lori Flaherty, coordinator for the National 911 Program. Lori, please go ahead. Thanks, Sherry, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. It is my pleasure to introduce the first two speakers for our webinar today, Mr. Michael Garcia and Mr. Mark Grubb. As Sherry said, Michael is a policy analyst with the National Governors Association's Homeland Security and Public Safety Division, and Mark is an IT specialist with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's Office of Emergency Communications. It has been my pleasure to work with both of these gentlemen on the project that they're about to tell you about uh, in terms of connecting the dots uh, with the 911 folks, with other folks in the state in emergency communications. I've been really impressed with how this project has gone, and I really appreciate both of them being willing to talk about it with you today. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Lori. Uh, this is Michael Garcia at NGA. Um, I'm going to present the first few slides, and I'm going to hand over to Mark. Um, but just for uh, some quick context, uh, I've been here for about three years now, and I actually um, was on a the same webinar that you all are doing today, probably about a year or so ago, on a very similar project, which I'll talk about here in a bit. But just for some quick context for those of you who are unaware of who NGA is, um, we're a bipartisan organization that represents all 55 of the nation's governors. And uh, we are housed basically in, in two different offices. Our first office is our Office of Government Relations, and that's really kind of the um, lobbying side for the governors that uh, advance their priorities uh, to the administration and to Congress. And then the other side is the Center for Best Practices, which where I reside. And that's really a, a mix between a, a think tank and consultancy um, firm, if you will. And so um, we, we cover a whole host of issues, one of which is emergency communications. and 
to Lori, as Lori pointed out, really what we've been focusing on, or at least since I've been here, is make sure we, we bridge the nexus between traditional landmark radio, now one, next generation now one, and broadband, and, and more broadly, uh, FirstNet. Um, so with that, if we go to the next slide. So as you see here is a, a brief snapshot of uh, our partnership with um, the Office of Emergency Communications. So, so quickly, I'll talk about how we got to where we are today. So as you can see, uh, NGA has been involved in emergency communications for quite some time. We hosted a policy academy back in 2009. And the phrase policy academy is what we call a, a year-long commitment or, or maybe a little more, where NGA provides in-depth technical assistance to a class of states to address a particular challenge they are facing, and in this case, uh, it's emergency communications. Those efforts eventually culminated in 2010 when the Department of Homeland Security created the National Council of Statewide Interoperability Coordinators, or NICSWIC, to support uh, the Statewide Interoperability Coordinators, or SWICs, which I'll refer to those acronyms from, from now on. Um, and, and that body, the NICSWIC, is to assist in providing technical assistance and developing specific products and, and services uh, for the nation's SWICs. If you fast forward to 2015, which is when I came on board in NGA, I assisted in leading another policy academy with five states, which I'll cover in more detail on the next slide, but that project lasted through 2016 and included with a paper that I published in the spring of 2017. That paper identified four key lessons learned, which you see at the top right corner here. And really what we saw was that uh, there's a need for us, when I say us, NGA and OEC, to engage the rest of the states and territories to implement these, these lesson learns. And, and I'll talk about these more in, in a bit here. And so what we thought the best way to fill that goal was through four regional workshops. Uh, with the first one we held uh, in January this year and our final one coming up in a few weeks. And uh, I know Mark's going to talk about that more in, in a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, I was here when we first launched um, the latest policy academy back in uh, the 2016 timeframe. And we launched this policy academy to enhance governance for emergency communications, um, which I mentioned where we think about this really as a, as a whole ecosystem approach, if you will, including LAMO radio and, uh, or LMR, now one broadband, first net, and, and alerts and warnings. And our intent was to foster coordination across these tools and to elevate the importance of emergency communications within state government. So what we did is we issued a request for proposals for all the states to apply. Uh, we, we received a robust amount of applications and we eventually selected Alaska, Hawaii, Illinois, Utah, and West Virginia. Uh, as far as the project timeline, we convened the five, st the five states to develop strategic action plans uh, for the whole year. We then visited each state to convene large stakeholder groups to foster consensus on whatever project goal they're aiming towards. And then we, we reconvened them to share lessons learned uh, with each other and to identify future action steps. So as I mentioned, I then wrote a paper on the outcomes that you see on the slide. And there are there four key takeaways. First off, we saw that there's a need to create and or revigorate any uh, active governance body that fosters consensus and coordination. Um, in some cases, uh, there was a body such as the Statewide Interoperability Executive Council, such as or called SIEC, that was there but not necessarily active. In other cases, there are times where there's just silos where you might have a state 901 board or a conglomerate of local 901 boards but not necessarily working with state level uh, officials. So we saw there's, there's a need to bridge those, those divides. Secondly, um, revitalizing the statewide uh, communications plan, which is referred to as uh, the SCIP, um, so it becomes implementable and viewed as a state plan uh, for all things emergency communications. And when we see in those plans that it encompasses the whole ecosystem that we mentioned, but it may not be viewed as the go-to source for all parties who need to be involved. So we saw a need to revitalize that and to really make sure that people were seeing that. Thirdly, ensuring that legislators understood how these technologies interact with one another and the importance of sustaining and funding each of them. And really the crux to this was debunking any myths that are out there about technologies. Um, for instance, I remember, I recall that there was a lot of confusion as to how Next Generation 901 differed from FirstNet, which we all here on, on the phone call probably know, and it seems kind of maybe laughable for some, but for some legislators and those who are unaware of this issue area, it was a very nuanced and confusing conversation. So we saw that there was a need to really 
articulate at a high level what those differences are and how they are both equally important. And lastly, we saw that there's a need for a full-time coordinator um, to ensure that there's coordination across all forms of governance actors. Um, currently, I think there are only 14 full-time SWICs or, or around that, um, some of which are being tapped as the uh, state point of contact or, or SPOC or the de facto SPOC. And so we want to emphasize that this really requires more manpower than just somebody who's probably, you know, more than dual-hatted or, or triple-hatted or quadruple-hatted working on this issue. Whether or not that's the SWIC or it's an, it's an active governance body or what have you, we saw that there's a need for full-time um, employees to be working on, on this coordination. Um, next slide, please. And so what you see here is um, where we're currently at with these regional workshops. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we in OEC uh, saw the need to oper operationalize these lessons learned, and so we decided to host four regional workshops to engage as many states as we could. Um, so to date, we've hosted three workshops with 26 states, and our fourth workshop, which we are um, actually splitting into two because we just received such an overwhelming response, um, we'll be convening 21 to 22 states. So we are really excited that by the end of the day, um, we'll be engaging somewhere between 47 and 48 states, which for us, um, we're ecstatic about. We, we honestly thought maybe we would get to 35, as you see here. So um, to get you know, over a dozen more was, was fantastic. Um, and so at these workshops, we usually have uh, two to three panels. But really, the bulk of the day is focused on states sharing lessons learned from each other, um, which uh, those always are great, robust conversations, and it's always great seeing those minds connecting and people making those new relationships. And then secondly, is something we call state team time. And, and what this is are facilitated sessions where we walk through with each state team to create an action plan to overcome any current challenges that they face. And following each of these workshops, uh, OEC follows up with the state teams to assess how they're doing and how they can offer um, any technical assistance uh, that they may need. And at the end of this uh, endeavor, uh, we will be writing a report based off of what we've learned um, and to share some of those uh, best practices. Um, so I'll, I'll definitely make sure that you all are proud of that once uh, it is published. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, we've had three workshops to date where you receive those uh, dates and then as well as the plan one in Philadelphia, and we'll now actually be extending that by an extra uh, day and a half into the 27th. And I know Mark will have a slide on this in a bit, but we really pushed every state to um, engage as many stakeholders or a diverse stakeholder group as they could. So we wanted people from public safety, emergency management, um, from their IT offices, from their locals. Um, what we really wanted to strive for that cross interdisciplinary teams. And we, we saw that those teams actually did that. They found those com these conversations, these workshops, far more impactful because when you're back in the state, you're in the grind, you're kind of in your rut, if you will. You don't get to really um, focus at a high level strategically and you get to interact maybe with these folks on a day-to-day -day basis. So they found it very, very useful. And I know we have some more breakdown on those participants later on. Um, next slide, please. So these next three slides I'll go by pretty quickly. Um, and they just kind of break down each uh, workshop. So we had eight states participate. We were going to have nine, but there was a uh, crazy ice storm that impacted one state, so they couldn't actually attend. Um, we, it was actually, we were in New Orleans for that workshop, and Mark will attest to this too. It was uh, the coldest snap they've had in, I think, like over a couple decades. So, it, you know, we, we thought we were going somewhere warm, and go figure, it was almost snowing. Um, but I digress. Anyway. Uh, we had full participation with SWIFTS and a variety of stakeholders, and uh, what they created were, like I said, they focused on action plans. Four states plan to pursue new legislation, uh, three identified steps for uh, next generation, now one planning, uh, three more focus on keeping LMR as a, as a priority and ensuring that there is education around why it's important to keep funding that um, in lieu of uh, the build out of FirstNet. And then you have two states each working on implementing statewide, statewide radio systems as well as life cycle planning. Uh, next slide, please. 
For our Southwest workshop, we were in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We had seven states uh, apply to that one. And the difference between uh, the Southwest and the Southeast was that, and this is really thanks to Lori, that we saw a need that we really need to get now one folks in the room. We, we pushed states to really try to get them in the first time around and it, the message kind of fell flat, so we were able to really rally the troops. And this this time, we saw an equal participation of 911 administrators or someone of that level uh, participate in these workshops. And we found those conversations to be a lot more robust and diverse, which I think was the benefit of all the participants. So we were really happy about that. Um, as you see, states were pursuing new legislation, developing uh, charters, and SIGBI. Um, and that's another word for statewide interoperability executive councils. That uh, SIGB is a statewide interoperability governance board. Um, this clarification: uh, states were focused on getting more organized around next generation 911 planning, um, planning out statewide radio systems, and then identifying political champions who could push forward legislation or executive orders to revitalize or create uh, these uh, governance bodies. Next slide, please. And more, most recently, we um, had a workshop in Portland, Oregon this past May. We saw a bump in states with 11. Uh, we had high participation of 911, uh, chief information officers, um, as well as FirstNet uh, officials, uh, the SPOCs, if you will. Um, and I'll mention, too, that in all these, uh, governor's offices were engaged as well, as well as, uh, at least in every one of these workshops, there were a few legislators who uh, attended. Um, which was which was fascinating. They always offer some great insights for everybody in the room. Um, once again, some of the key highlights: um, a couple of states were identifying funding streams for long-term uh, funding for all their program areas. Uh, states were once again trying to get more organized around next generation now one planning, and including funding considerations um, and and planning. You see that third bullet there. And then lastly, there was still this need um, and desire to continually find um, a funding stream. So with that, um, I think we'll go to the next slide and I'll hand it over to uh, my colleague, Mark Grubb. Great, thanks, Michael. And first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Lori and, and Sherry for inviting us today to be on this webinar. This is a great experience for us and we really appreciate everyone's time on here. Um, and uh, I'd like to really thank uh, NGA and especially Michael for, for partnering with OEC to put these workshops on. Um, they're, they're probably one of the single most important things we've done in a while, and uh, as, as, you, as can be attested to from the, the participation of, of 48 states and territories. So um, we'll just really quickly go through, you know, some of the participation um, and, and not to belabor, but I, I think this, this slide just shows you, you know, ju just, uh, you know, how many states came who came and uh, the Northeast uh, workshop in Philadelphia coming up in two weeks gives you an idea. There's actually 22 anticipated states. So, so that just gives a little bit more detail on, on the participation itself. We can move to the next slide and, and get a little bit more into detail of how that was broken out. So this is, this is just a saturation map of, of, of what we've been able to achieve through these four workshops. So you can see that, that we've, we've hit a, a, significant, a significant part of the country. So we can move on. Um, the uh, director's initial goal was 35 states, and of course we're, we're, we're now up to 48. So we can move to the next slide. This just gives you an idea of, of how the attendance uh, happened. So in the first one we had 17 people that attended uh, through the eight states. And then through uh, especially uh, Lori Flaherty's help with, with urging 911 participants, we actually bumped uh, to 32 people for the second one and had one fewer state attend. And then when we got to Portland, uh, we had 11 states, but, but you know, participation grew to 63 people. And then uh, for the anticipated one, that number of 64 is now outdated. We're closer to 80 to 82 uh, people attending our, our last uh, workshop in Philadelphia. So we can go to the next slide. So this really, the, the one thing I want to highlight here is, is really, if you look at the southeast, so that's the top bar chart and, and the second chart down right there, yeah. Um, it just shows the 
um, the amount of 911 folks that were in the room. And then if you go to the second bar chart down and the, and the orange bar uh, second from the top, that shows how many 911 folks actually came to the, to the second workshop, and it's just continued from there. So I think that's important to note, especially on this webinar. And, and thanks again to Lori and, and, and 911 for, for bringing 911 folks to the room to talk about the whole ecosystem. When we talk about the ecosystem in OEC, we, we're talking about land mobile radio, LTE, 911, and alerts and warnings. So those, those are the four technologies that we focus on in the ecosystem because they need to play together. And we don't say that they need to be managed in one place, but they need to be coordinated together, and, and the coordination happens through the National Council of Statewide Interoperability Coordinators, and you'll hear more from, from Nikki and Lance on that here in a little bit. But, there, you know, the, the, you know that, that growth um, in, in not just people attending, but specifically 911 was, was really significant for us. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So... <clears throat> When we went to the, when we had these meetings, the, the states identified challenges um, that they needed to overcome, and then we then we worked with them to develop a set of goals, state-specific goals, to help them overcome those challenges. But the top five challenges that we heard was coordination with locals. So, so that was that was one of the big uh, things that we heard from a governance perspective, a communications governance perspective. There needed to be more coordination with locals. Um, so, so that's you know that's important. Local authority over grant dollars, home rule states has become a, a, a big issue, of course, and lack of active participation in the SIGBs. Um, the, that's a challenge. And then um, the, there's a lack of clear incentives for participating in the SIGBs and the SICs, the governance bodies for each state. Um, so those have been identified, and states have come up with goals to try to to uh, improve outreach and, and and get more local participation on those on those governing bodies. The second challenge was legislative support, exposure, and education. Um, I, I think one that we've been able to tackle through, uh, especially by having NGA partner with us, and is is bringing legislative support and governors' offices to the table at these meetings. That's been huge, and I'm going to go over a couple of examples here in a second, and, and you'll see how important it was to bring some some of those folks into the room. So we can move to the next slide. Um, the, another challenge was uh, SIGB membership. We talked about that lack of participation. Uh, participation is stag stagnant and influ influential members sending non-influential proxies. That happens almost in every state. Um, some states still don't have a governing body, or if they do, they don't meet. Um, the fourth challenge was consolidated and coordinated governance. So 911 is often governed separately from, from the SIGB. And, and um, I didn't mention it, but prior to, to going to the Office of Emergency Communications on the federal side, I was the director of communications, the SWIC and the SPOC for the state of Delaware up until late last year. And, and one of the things that we were able to do is, is bring those, those uh, folks together. They're now managed by, uh, by one group in Delaware, but they weren't uh, when I was there. And, but, but we did coordinate closely in our SIEC meetings, so we were always talking, and that was very helpful and, and, and proved to, to be um, hugely advantageous for emergency communications in Delaware and getting new technologies move forward and so on and so forth. So, um, so it is helpful that we at least talk about all these technologies in, in one room so, so states and lo uh, locals can, can kind of figure out what everybody's doing in the different technologies and eventually how they're going to come together and, and how we can serve the public. Um, the fifth um, uh, challenge was the executive branch support, exposure, and education. And there were concerns about loss of momentum with administration changes and, and how best to plan for those changes and changes of, of governors and, and leadership and so on and so forth. And, and a lot of states, you know, talked about that and how are they going to combat that. And, and we actually got some traction with our, our legislative support and some governor, governor's uh, office support that came to the meetings, giving ideas on how to best uh, attack that. Next slide, please. So 
um, we're not going to run down these, but this is just all the other challenge areas that they talked about. Um, and, and, and not that they're not important, but there's a lot of them, and there's a lot of challenges that, that different states are working through. Um, next slide, please. So I think this is maybe the most important slide, and what this uh, talks about is some of the successes that we had. And so um, the very first success we had was in the first meeting with Kansas. Kansas, in the first workshop, they brought their SWIC, they brought a C, their CIO, and they brought a legislator. And <clears throat> during their state team time breakouts over the day and a half, they literally sat down, they wrote legislation to form their SIEC, who was going to be on that governing body. They submitted it before they left uh, New Orleans, and it is now passed and signed into law um, by Governor Kohler. So this is um, – this is – this was huge. This was a huge uh, momentum shift for Kansas, and and um, it, it was it was big for the workshops because it was a you know huge success. Um, Missouri has set up a comprehensive action plan through their goals that they developed at the workshop, and and they're moving. Uh, we just spoke with them last week, and most of the goals that they set aside are set up in the workshop. They've made significant progress, and that includes everything from coordinating with 911 better to uh, adding towers for their LMR system. And so they moved, um, you know, they, they, they're moving in a great direction. And then in the last workshop in Portland, um, Idaho um, came to the table and talked about their uh, their SWIC role, and, and they had a representative there who talked about the importance of legislation um, uh, and, and how to get to legislators, what to talk about when you talk to, to legislators. And the, the representative that came to the Idaho meeting or to the to Portland meeting for Idaho said, if there's one thing I could tell fellow legislators throughout the country is these workshops are probably one of the single most important things you can attend to understand how important emergency communications is in the United States and how little some legislators really know about the importance of emergency communications. Let's face it, they, they, they think it works in, in a lot of places. 911 calls are happening. And 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 they're they're you know the 911 calls are being dispatched and you know first responders are responding so they think that works they don't understand the intricacies of funding and support and 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 sustainability and all of the things that we talk about on a regular basis um, the, the this legislator went uh, told me before he left he said I'm going to go back and put funding our SWIC to the top of the budget cycle for the next um, for the next budget cycle so we can get our full-time SWIC in place. And, and so that was hugely helpful for us. So, so we think those are three, um, you know, huge wins for these workshops. There have been more, and, and we're really looking forward to the 22 states in, in Philadelphia because we know there will be more there. Um, I, I'm not sure, but I think that might be close to the last slide if we can move on. Yeah, so um, so that's that's it for us. <laughs> Thank you. We'll now start the Q and A portion of our session. And as a reminder, to ask a question, you can use either the WebEx chat feature or press the raise hand button. Thank you, Sherry. Our first question: Is there any plan to reach out to the states that haven't participated? Yeah, I'll take that at first, Mark. Um, so this is Michael at NGA. We we um, started this way back in December as far as outreach, and we blasted it out to um, all of our networks here at NGA. I know um, OEC sent it out as well, and I, I know that um, uh, Lori as well has been uh, and, and telling folks uh, at this point we are at the wrapping up our last ones, and we are at capacity for our fourth regional workshop. Um, but that does not mean that we cannot be engaged for technical assistance. Um, we always uh, want to hear from states of what their concerns are or how we can assist. So just because that um, they may not be able to engage in these particular workshops, I know at least here at NGA and I'm sure for OEC as well, we would love to um, hear from the states and how we can best assist. Michael, Michael may may not want to to hear this. I'm not sure, but. 
Um, we have had <laughs> we have had several uh, states tell us that it would be great to have these workshops every couple of years to to keep the the momentum moving forward. So states might have a chance in the future to to attend one of these if we're able to to move that idea forward. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, for the listeners today, can you remind them what does SIGB stand for? Yeah, that's, so that's a statewide in, uh, interoperability governing board or governing body. It's, the same, it's basically the same terminology as, as the SIEC, which is the Statewide Interoperability Executive Council. Um, those are just two of the acronyms. D different states use other acronyms for their, their communi emergency communications governing bodies. Thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, one of the listeners is interested to learn what the latest information on the consolidation of nine, nine, excuse me, 911 points or PSAPs you might have to provide. Yeah, so, so consolidation of 911 is, is something that, um, you know, really is not talked about at these meetings because this is more of a governance body. Uh, conversation, these workshops. So, so they didn't. We we really haven't broached that subject, and we we haven't uh, had a lot of questions about that in, in these workshops. Although I know a lot of states are are considering the need for for consolidating. Okay, um, thank you to both Mr. Garcia and Mr. Grubb. Lori, I'm going to turn it back over to you and ask you to introduce our next. Speakers. Thanks, Sherry. So next, we're going to have a couple people from Oklahoma share their experience in attending the workshop and creating their emergency communications plan. And with us today, we have Nikki Cassingham, who is the Oklahoma Statewide Interoperability Coordinator. And Nikki is also the chair of the National Council of SWICs. Um, we also have Mr. Lance Terry, who's the Oklahoma State 911 coordinator. Uh, I think one of the things that has really impressed me as I've gotten to know both of these groups, both the SWICs and the State 911 folks, is how much their jobs are alike, how much they, they face a lot of the same challenges, and how much they can benefit from a, a relation, an ongoing relationship. Um, you know, if you if you're interested in you know the NICSWICs, if you just do a Google for uh, NCSWIC, you know, on the DHS website, you'll learn more about them. And if you're interested about the state 911 coordinators, there is a group called NASNO, the National Association of State 911 Administrators, which is their counterpart. Uh, but I'm really happy that Nikki and Lance are with us today, and I'm going to turn it over to them. Thank you, Lori. Um, again, my name is Lance Terry, and uh, thanks to uh, Mark and Michael for getting us set up um, uh, with their presentation. Uh, if, um, if anyone can't understand my Okie accent, then uh, we have a wonderful uh, lady who's typing out everything we say in the lower right-hand corner, so try to keep up as best you can. Um, Nick Carrero, is, uh, he, um, he was supposed to join us on this uh, call also, but he's uh, been uh, he had a family emergency and pulled him away from it. So, Nikki and I are going to uh, kind of let you guys know what our experience was uh, in New Mexico with the uh, NGA uh, conference or the workshop. So, uh, go ahead, next slide. So, some of the unique challenges we have in Oklahoma. Um, first is with 911 specifically, we're, we are, uh, um, we only have, well, we're, we're one of five states that do not have a 911 plan. Uh, but starting off back when interoperable communications first uh, came to light back in 2002-2003, uh, we, we made a uh, decision as a state to try to cover as much population as we can. So we, in Oklahoma we have a, the I-44 corridor, which is what we uh, refer to it as. The I-44 corridor covers about 20% of the land mass and 80% of the population. So when we rolled out our statewide LMR system, uh, which we call OQIN, uh, OQIN, uh, we, we tied together uh, six different systems together into a statewide system is what we call it. However, it's really not statewide. It's, uh, it's actually 
uh, more of an urban system covering the majority of the population and not necessarily rural. So one of the challenges we've had uh, because of that is, um, you know, just like other states, uh, Oklahoma is more controlled by the landmass, which is rural Oklahoma. Um, so as we've moved forward, we've had a difficult time in sustainability because of our uh, and our build out of, of this of this oak wind system into the rural areas for the simple fact of it's very cost it's not cost effective and um, and we and and now that money has gotten tight we've had a very difficult time trying to figure out how do we fund uh, or how do we uh, take care of the rural areas and and, and without. Uh, degrading away from our, from what we've, the work we've done in the urban area, so there's this competition of funds that are going on uh, as it relates to the the sustainability. The state radio systems, there's multiple different state radio systems, so we don't have one just for uh, all of public safety. For instance, uh, we have different radio systems uh, even within our state public safety um, agencies, uh, and so. That also has, a, has, a, has a, its own challenge. Uh, Department of Transportation also has a, a failing radio system or, or an aged out radio system that needs to be replaced also. So the money has kind of stopped uh, coming down from federal levels, as we all know, uh, but we, so we have these unique challenges as it relates to interoperable communications. Uh, go ahead, next slide, please. So with 911, uh, we we have five counties uh, currently that do not have enhanced 911. We actually have two counties uh, that do not have 911 addressing at all, and so they're still running off of a rural route, uh, and and um, and that's obviously uh, a big issue. Uh, we found out recently that you cannot uh, obtain a passport um, unless you have uh, a 911 address, and also. Federal subsidies for farmers cannot be mailed to an address uh, unless they have a 911 address. So they're no longer sending it to a rural route address. Uh, those are some some things we're facing immediately, and um, we're also in Oklahoma. We do not have um, the proper driver's license for travel, and so uh, everyone's having to file for a passport. And since they don't have a 911 address, uh, it, it's becoming a, a very hot button at a high level. Uh, we also do not have a, a plan for next gen one. We're actually holding a workshop today and tomorrow uh, for to uh, write a scope of work for strategic planning for next gen one. So, uh, so we are behind the curve as it relates to uh, next gen one one and and what is best for Oklahoma. With that, 96% of our funding goes to the local PSAP, so we only keep about 4% at the at the state level, and so that's also a, a, a unique challenge as it relates to moving uh, one forward. And, and with a future slide here in just a second, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of explain the state oversight for 911 and how that's how that's been developed over the last couple of years. But we have not had a state 911 coordination at the at the state level uh, for 911, and therefore we've created these islands of 911 deployments all over the state over the last uh, 20 years, almost 30 years, that that have very strong footholds in what they're doing. But now we need to try to coordinate them and bring them forward. And I think that's no different than with uh, with our the radio side uh, and also uh, with uh, networks uh, and and with LTE. Next slide. So with that, uh, we we've had two bills that have passed over the last couple of years. The first one primarily was focused around interoperable communications. Uh, Senate Bill uh, 1112 established a land mobile radio public safety interoperability cooperative. So the situation is, is we have uh, we have the state IT, uh, which is under finance administration, uh, who is really, uh, they're in charge of anything that plugs into a wall or has wheels on it. And so a radio system would fall underneath that. However, over the years, they've kind of been silent. Uh, and so public safety uh, and the Department of Transportation have done their own thing. And so they have overlapping coverage between those two between those two systems uh, and and various other systems uh, across. And an example would be Department of Public Safety oversees Oakwind, which is that I-44 corridor um, uh, 800 megahertz radio system. 
Yet the OSBI, the State Bureau of Investigations, they have their own statewide radio system. I believe it's on VHF. So what this bill did is it, said, is it established this interoperability of co uh, cooperative between the three agencies, between the three cabinet secretaries, to, to force them to work together to figure out how can we deploy 911 in Oklahoma. The, um, the, the other bill that passed was House Bill 3126, which established the Oklahoma 911 Management Authority. Uh, it, it primarily did three things. One is it raised our, 911, our wireless 911 fee from 50 cents to 75 cents. Uh, it also uh, allowed the state, the Oklahoma 911 Management Authority, to hire a 911 coordinator and fund the office. And that office is funded and housed under the Oklahoma Emergency Management Office in Oklahoma. The, uh, the last thing it did is it provided oversight. So uh, because we have not had state oversight and we've allowed these islands to be built all over Oklahoma, uh, we, we had to come up with a way to, to try to bring all of them together and start working together uh, as, a, as a whole to, um, uh, to, to narrow the gap, per se, and start moving us into the next-gen environment, which we know will be, will be costly and also uh, uh, a, a lot more uh, uh, technical, uh, per se, than what we've, we've seen in the past. Next slide. So as we started looking at this uh, before the NGA conference, we, we, we looked at this as, what, what, what will it take to be successful? And so you've seen a, a, one of these PowerPoints, uh, or one of these uh, PowerPoint slides before, and, and uh, this is my twist on it. So, uh, the, you know, on the left, you got the people that are that are walking around, staring at their phones, uh, and finally see an emergency, so they text 911 or they call. Um, and and that link between the, the citizens and 911 is under the emergency management um, uh, governor appointee. And so, me being the 911 coordinator working for the authority under emergency management, I have my own chain of command, uh, and and people that I work with every day in my office, in my building, and as all good state employees, we don't look at what anybody else is doing around the state. We just stay in our little hole and 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 work. So with that, uh, go ahead and click again. Uh, the um, so, so with 911, you can go ahead and finish out that slide. Two more or one more. There we go. So, when you when we bring in FirstNet, FirstNet is actually the management management enterprise services, Oklahoma Emerge, uh, Management OMES. OMES is that state IT department that controls everything that plugs into a wall and everything that has wheels. So that's where FirstNet is housed, and so they have their own chain of command and their own building uh, and, and their own basement that they can lock themselves into also. Then you have Department of Public Safety, which oversees Oakwin, um, and, and it's kind of the, the state radio system, per se. And, and, and I didn't add this to the slide, but we also have um, our SWIC, who is actually in Homeland Security, with their own uh, uh, chain of command and, and, and upward management. So early on, within as soon after, in 2016, after these two bills passed, uh, I was hired as a state knowledge coordinator, and uh, I've been in public safety in Oklahoma for 30 years, yet I didn't really have a full grasp, uh, I had a local grasp within the, uh, the city I was at, but I didn't have a full grasp of what was going on at the state level and how really disconnected we were. Um, and we all, we have all these acronyms, we have everything, you know, and, and we're all working within these groups and there's governance structures and all of that, yet we really don't meet and we really weren't getting a whole lot done. Uh, next slide. So with that, uh, we kind of reached out to each other and I knew, I knew everybody uh, because I work for the, the uh, city and so I had relationships with our SWIC, with the, the, the uh, uh, Nick Carrera over at the state radio shop, um, uh, with uh, uh, James or, uh, and our Spock, uh, uh, Ben G over at OMES. So we had all these relationships, but we really weren't, weren't, uh, weren't communicating very well. Um, and I think the big thing is, is we all have the same audience. We are sitting in front of the same people everywhere that we go. However, we really didn't understand what each other's missions really were. And so, 
uh, you know, we made some phone calls and, and I sent you have a friend request with these islands and this, this cartoon, uh, don't tell cartoonstock.com that I borrowed this, but um, um, it, it really depicts exactly where we were at. We have these islands uh, with, with radio, with FirstNet, with state IT, uh, with the SWIC, and, and with 911 now, and we were doing our own thing, yet we were still talking to the same people. Next slide. So we came up, everybody has to have an acronym, and so uh, uh, I, I got together and said, hey, we work in different buildings, we do not interact with each other, we do not have the ability to have water cooler talk. And so nobody at the coffee pot talking, hey, what did you do this weekend, and things like that. So we got together and we formed the stick coats. Uh, there's our three-headed monster up at the top, the three guys on the three horses, that's our three cabinet chairs that we all report to, and they talk. Uh, and then we've got the, the, the stick coat Pony Express down at the bottom that's, that we, uh, we're all saying the same thing, we all have the same message, we need to coordinate together. So we, we informally named them the State Technology Communicators Communicating About Technology, uh, the stick coats. Uh, we thought that was all tongue-in-cheek and things like that until NGA came forward and said, hey, you guys should all be talking with each other. And we went, hey, that's a great idea. Uh, maybe we should call ourselves something di different. So we got together and, 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 uh, and Nikki reached out to me as soon as the NGA came out with the workshop and said, hey, we need you involved. Uh, they reached out to the governor's office and uh, got them to approve us, to uh, approve the 911 uh, part to be uh, included within the workshop. Next slide. So with that said, um, you know, we, we, we knew we were going to, to need to strengthen or work off of this stick coat uh, group that we informally uh, worked with. One more thing that we do with the stick coats is we, we get together and have coffee and a sweet tea in the afternoon. We'll meet somewhere, uh, we, you know, we try to meet every couple of three weeks and sit down and, and coordinate efforts outside of the, a formal area, outside of the, where we have a big audience. We really try to sit down and communicate each other's needs, problems that we're facing, and then we, then we coordinate efforts as we move forward. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Nikki Cassingham to uh, talk about our successes through the workshop. Thank you, Lance. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of want to just make sure that you're very clear on that stick coat meeting has become an instrumental tool for us, um, not just for us to have a better understanding of each other's roles on a daily basis. Again, we, we were at the same meetings, attending with the same 10 or 15, 20 people consistently, but we were never really able to break it down on what our extremely difficult day-to-day -day operational challenges were, and this has really helped us identify that in a more relaxed environment and away from our peers outside of some of those larger, you know, working groups or sessions or a SIGB meeting. Um, so that already has paid off immensely and made a huge strive in success for us and our communication levels and being able to take some of those messages back to some of our cabinet, men or cabinet member appointees or our bosses. Um, with that, one of the other benefits that we really pulled out of attending the New Mexico NGA OEC workshop was um, through getting the approvals from our governor to make sure that we had the SWIC, the SPOC, the 911 coordinator, and a project manager who also was working kind of hand in hand with our SPOC, it really allowed us, and the program manager, I'm sorry, of our LMR systems, it really allowed us that excellent capabilities of working with the staff of OEC and NGA staff to help us strengthen a plan of um, more aligns with helping us make more of a public safety communications office, if you will where we can help them understand the importance and the strength that we need to be working with each other on a daily basis, and those lanes, if you will, or the, the highlighted critical importance of emerging public safety communications moving in that direction needs to be identified, needs to help us strengthen that one voice, if you will. We're kind of going back onto this as our new, our new uh, logo, if you will. We're trying to strengthen that we're all sending the right message that the emerging technology of broadband, next gen 911, LMR, whether you're, what arena you're in there, we have a huge struggle in Oklahoma with the difference between the urban areas and the rural areas and what those challenges have brought to the table due to the lack of funding, due to the lack of being able to sustain radio replacement. Um, you know, again, back in 22, 2003, 
when my lot of federal funds were being pumped into the states to enhance and build and expand those radio systems. Now we're in the crisis mode of, and, and Oklahoma has a huge volunteer fire department uh, or division that's strung out across the state. Obviously, we've become kind of a wildfire state, unfortunately, in the last few years. And they don't have the funding to replace some of those mechanisms. And the fear for us, and one of the challenges that we've brought to light and are working on diligently is some of the misconceptions that now the vendors are growing very aggressively on trying to push that you can use your smart device as your mission critical voice. We all know that that is not where we are yet. Hopefully we see that in the, the future, but it is a great concern of a life safety issue when you're working with, because of the cost factors and the lack of funding to be able to help them at these um, end of life radio platforms, they are looking at that as their only alterna uh, alternative because that's what they can afford. And so we're really working diligently to make sure that right message is being put out there that was another good conversation, I think, or outcome that came from us being able to sit at the table for two days and work very diligently with this group of folks that uh, from Oklahoma were able to participate. We also um, worked very well with some of the other states that got to participate at our same New Mexico workshop, which were um, Iowa, Ohio, Wisconsin, and New Mexico participants. We all kind of, you know, during some of those discussions were able to pick and borrow and steal some ideas and some legislative um, information and movements from those other participants. And it really helped us understand what we might need to put stronger legislative plans and backing to get to our legislators to help reinforce the support that we need for these positions. Um, next slide. So again, this just kind of outlines what we were really working on strengthening. We do have a very active SIGB, but again, um, it is challenging when you're dealing with the same 10 or 15 or 20 people that are also on your public safety broadband governance board, your 911 advisory board. You start circling around these same individuals. And so we really wanted to take a harder look at how do we strengthen our new governance charter plan. And we've got a very good outline for that. We have, a, I think, a pretty robust charter. We just feel that we need to get some stronger language and maybe some more legislative support from that and, re and tweak that a little bit. And that was a huge outcome for us from working in the New Mexico NGA OEC workshop. Um, and again, that will also reinforce and help us to establish some of that more leadership buy-in. Um, we are looking at a new governor being elected in Oklahoma in November. So right now we're kind of in a a holding pattern, if you will. No one wants to make any executive or important decisions. So what we're trying to do on the back end is make sure that we have an extremely robust plan in place so that when that new leadership team comes into place, we will be prepared to have our ducks in a row and a meeting to be able to walk in the door with what we're wanting to push forward and hopefully get that buy-in and support right off the bat. Um, next slide. Uh, I kind of already covered that. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. And then I think that's where I'll turn it back over to Lance to see if he has any final remarks before we open it up to questions and answers. Yeah, I think, thanks, Nikki. The, you know, the, our, our, we're, no, we're no different than many other states. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of states out that have the same problems we, that Oklahoma has. We all work for different people. We all have, uh, all of our bosses have different priorities than what we have. Um, you know, as we as we move forward, and I think that's what the NGA conference really supported, was that we all have to get together. We have to come up with a strong business plan to make sure that our bosses understand the importance of collaboration between the, the, the various different state agencies and local agencies to move this forward as one voice. Um, you know, the ecosystem end to end uh, starts with the citizen calling 911 and ends with the citizen being notified uh, of, the, of the problem. Public safety is just the loop to get it back to the citizens to, to, to help coordinate and save lives. Uh, and we're, we're, you know, 911 is the, the intro to that, the start of that. Uh, we have definitely had challenges with, you know, there's no training program. There's nothing in Oklahoma as it relates to training 911 dispatchers. We do not train our, our users of radios. So uh, we believe that a strong business plan to coordinate all uh, of these four elements together will definitely 
uh, move us in the right direction and, and get us off high center and be able to, to, uh, to be successful in Oklahoma. So uh, with that, we'll turn it back over to uh, Lori and Sherry and for questions. Thank you. So we'll start the QA portion of our session. And again, as a reminder, if you have a question, please use the WebEx chat feature located on the right-hand side of the screen or press the raise hand button so that we can unmute your phone line. Thank you, Sherry. Our first question, what are your next steps for the plan? Uh, basically, well, we've had a few we've had a few uh, hiccups. Uh, um, ben G, uh, which was our, I'll, I'll try to pronounce his last name, but I'm not going to do that. He's our Spock, and he actually has, is now working for the state of Oregon. And so he was with us at the NGA conference, and they're currently filling his position. And his, and th and that Spock works for the state IT department, or yeah, state IT department. And so uh, basically, what we're working on now is taking our our plan that we have we have in a draft form and getting that prepared for the new governor when they come in. And then I think our first step is to make sure that each one of our updates that we provide within the state of Oklahoma that pass through our individual chain of command that goes up reinforces the fact that we need to to change uh, or, or clean up state statute. I don't want to say change statute, but we need to clean it up that, that make sure that we do that we draw alliances together between those three those three cabinet secretaries to make sure that it's it's law that we have to work together. Yeah, and that was and one additional thing that has really been instrumental in helping us kind of get this done in a very short time frame is we were able to get um, three technical assistants through the Office of Emergency Communications kind of rushed through for us to make sure we get those concluded by the end of the year so that we can help get these ro these plans in a mo more robust fashion to prepare to present to the new governor and their staff, which was one of the next Gen 911 TAs, which is where Lance and I are today currently uh, facilitating and helping assist with that. We have an approval for an alerts and warning because that is another area that we need to enhance and make sure that we have that updated and are working through those situations. And then the other one was, um, you know, just helping us reinforce that strengthening of our, our SCIP and our SIGB and our governance bodies and making sure that we're identifying the outlines of how that really needs to work with the future of um, adding in the next gen 911, the broadband initiative, and enhancing the sustainability plans for the LMR. Thank you. What are the first steps other states can take to embark on a similar journey as Oklahoma? <laughs> I'll be honest with That's you. Tough. I can't. I, I can't. I cannot. Um, uh, you know, I cannot minimize the stick coat philosophy, and I, and I, and it's tongue in cheek. But the first thing you need to do is you need to get the the, the boots on the ground people that are leading the charge for 911, for FirstNet, uh, for Land Mobile Radio, and your SWIC. You need to get those four people together outside of the office, go to Panera Bread, have a sweet tea, sit down, and, and find out about each other. Uh, you need to figure out first who you are, and the second thing you need to do is you need to figure out, you know, what are your unique challenges? Um, what do I need to say when I go to, not, to, to the 911 people, uh, the sec, to that 911 piece of it, what do I need to say to that group that will help you uh, uh, coordinate radio uh, 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 interoperability, uh, 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 you know, support FirstNet, LTE, things like that. That is the first step. Get out of the office, get to know your, your counterparts in those other areas, and then see where your weaknesses are at, see where your strengths are at, and start building off of that. Thank you. How were you able to get your wireless fee increased, and was there pushback? Yeah, it took five years. Uh, it took five years to get that the the fee passed. Um, uh, yes, there was pushback. Yes, we asked for more money. Uh, you know, at the, at the end, they gave us the bare minimum we needed in order to establish an office, uh, in order to provide accountability and and provide statistics. Um, 
uh, like I said, we, we had we had several champions. Uh, you know, we're we are a red state, and so we are a very strong Republican. Uh, uh, we ran it under a Democrat um, a House representative uh, and senator a couple of times, and we finally found our champion that was able to move that forward. Uh, and so it's just finding the right person uh, in our legislative that 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 could that could carry it forward. And and luckily at the last we found one, uh, and um, he made the connections and made uh, and and made it happen. And you know, and just to go back on what Mark Grubb was saying earlier, it really does go back to at some of the legislative levels the lack of understanding and education in their minds, you know, it, it flows fine. I can pick up my phone, I can make a 911 call or call anybody on a cell phone. Why do you need to increase that rate? So they really did a fantastic job by truly educating. And I cannot tell you how many <laughs> numerous meetings Lance and his team had to run across the state and at the Capitol pretty much on a regular basis to help them understand the involvement in the technology the involvement in the, the price and the cost of what's not actually being identified. And that, I think, truly helped them understand the direction and the future and the way the technology was evolving. But it was truly, at their level, obviously it's not a priority for them, so they really had a huge lack of understanding of where it needed to be moving towards. And, and one more quick thing. They funded us in order for us to get a handle on it. So they gave us the minimum in order to for us to get a handle. Yeah. We needed statistics. We need information. We've got to get strong uh, reports back, uh, and we are still struggling with that today. Uh, we we have a leadership issue in 911 in Oklahoma uh, at the local level, and we we want to try to address that because if we can strengthen our local leadership, uh, then that will strengthen our our overall state uh, deployment of 911 and and raising the bar. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Terry and Ms. Cassingham. And again, thank you to all four of our speakers today. Lori, do you have any closing remarks? I'd also like to say thank you to everybody. Uh, I think through this experience, it just reiterated the fact that the, the discussion always starts with the technical piece. But as I like to remind my engineer friends, at the end of the day, people need to make sure that that technology gets into place. And as we all move forward toward a digital IP-based broadband kind of uh, infrastructure, it, it, I, you know, I cannot talk enough about how important the relationships are, you know, between folks like the SPOCs and the SWICs and the 911 coordinators. And I look forward to working with DHS on the next chapter. So thank you all, and I'll turn it back to uh, the team. This concludes today's webinar. We appreciate everyone's participation. As a reminder, an archived version of today's webinar will be available on 911.gov soon. The next webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, September 18th at noon Eastern Time. You hope, we hope you will all be able to join us then. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.